All right, Demon Phil Comics and More New Jersey here, and we've got an interview for you this evening. I'm going to give it just a minute or so longer to go ahead and see if we can get some more people built up in here. As you do come in, if you will, please go ahead and hit the comments. Let me know that you can see and hear me on here, and then let's start sharing this thing out. Just making sure everything is in order here, and since we are live, we can start sharing out from our end as well. <laughs> Russell, welcome to the show. Appreciate you being here, buddy. If you will go ahead and share out everything, we have got to come out with that reveal because this is just getting kind of creepy for everybody who doesn't know what's going on with the pantsless thing. <laughs> Hope everyone is having a great evening, has been safe and productive today. We have got an amazing interview for you this evening. Just want to give it another minute or so here to go ahead and let a few more people roll in here and make sure we're getting shared out. <laughs> Russell, I am, trust me, I am working with Jim on that and we are trying to get this thing completed. In fact, let me go ahead and message Jim because he wanted to message on this very quickly before we lock in our guest here. All right. Looks like we're up and running on both sides. We are both on Facebook and on YouTube simultaneously right now on both my channels, Comics and More New Jersey. And here we go. Let's go ahead and get this thing started. All right. Demon Phil, Comics and More New Jersey. I am here with yet another interview tonight. And tonight, well, let's just say you asked for more. You're going to get more on this one. Uh I have been looking forward to this for quite some time. I have had some amazing interviews on here and the tempo is just not going down anytime soon. So we're going to go ahead and bring someone out here who is just going to go ahead and hit us running with a few projects we've got going. I'm going to ask some questions. And if you have questions in the audience, build those up as well, because we'll try to hit them up with that. And we're going to have some fun with this. So without further ado, Monty Michael Moore. What's up, y'all? Welcome to Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> Monty, thank you for being here, buddy. I appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Lewis, Jim, thank you for being here out there. If y'all just make sure this is getting shared out. Oh, yeah. You'll notice in the comments, it's a fun group. <laughs> yeah, J Jim's like, oh, man, here comes the more puns. You're like, yeah, you wouldn't expect anything less, would you? <laughs> I promise I won't do it the entire show. I, I normally go on Monty's post and just throw more on there just as many times as I can. Absolutely. because I get. And that's I get the replies of BAM on it, which is great. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how I, I acknowledge that. I, I hijacked that from Emerald. BAM! <laughs> <laughs> well, to go ahead and get started into this, and I don't know who wouldn't know, but let's just go ahead and, and play like we don't know who you are. <laughs> who yeah. are you? Where do we find you? What do you do? Uh, so I've been in uh, comics, games, and entertainment as an artist for 28 years, Uh and I started uh, in comics in 1993. I had just come out of art school, had met a couple of guys who were self-publishing their own comic. And I was brought on board and I volunteered to be the colorist. I airbrushed the entire book by hand, every panel, every page. Uh, it was going to be called Lords of Light, but we had to change the name because apparently Harlan Ellison wrote some vague book back in the 60s called The Lord of the Light. And somebody had it under option for a movie and we got a cease and desist. So our book came out under the title of Lords. And it was really at the time that comics collapsed in like 1993, 94. And so we did not put out a second issue, but we went to San Diego Comic-Con for the first time. This was a nerds only event back then. I mean, there was probably four women that, that attended the entire thing. <laughs> Even though there was 30,000 people, it's not the, you know, 150,000 that show up now. And um, so I decided that I wanted to continue working in that vein, but that I would work for other people as a freelancer. And so I think, I don't think it was till 96 that I did my first freelance cover for Helena for Lightning Comics. It was a small little self-published. It was about the time that the kind of bad girl era really kind of took off. 
uh, eventually led to me doing work for uh, Vampirella, uh, Chaos Comics. I did a couple of covers for Chastity and Purgatory. And then SQP, which was a publisher that did a series of books called the Gallery Girl Books. So I had art in about half a dozen of theirs. And then the publisher said, wow, we really like your art. Do you want to have a whole book out? And so I said, give me six months. So I was only 25 years old when my first full art book was published. And I can remember other people who were art heroes of mine, like Larry Elmore going, you have your own art book? <laughs> like, you know, he's like, I'm, I'm 40, I'm 55. I don't have my own art book. And, you know, because people weren't really self-publishing their own stuff like that back then, unless you were, you know, somebody, you know, somebody really established. And um, so that was kind of my path. Uh, 1998, I went to Gen Con, which was my first gaming convention. And, like the gate top gaming version of San Diego con. And uh, so I have been going to that show and I haven't missed that show since 1998. And so I started doing work for Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, a lot of, a lot of work for Wizards of the Coast. So for about 10 years, I was actually doing much more work in games than it was comics, about 1998 to maybe 2008. Uh, then I started, a, a started, I was, I, joined another guy who was self-publishing his own game. So we have a small games company as well uh, that does tabletop gaming. And we've been doing that since 2004. So we have a, a party game called Wedge. We have a family game called Pirates of Gold Cove. Um, and I've worked for most of the publishers in the gaming industry and most of the publishers in the comics field. So some of the covers this year would have been uh, Vampirella uh, uh, for 50th anniversary. Then there was a, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle 100, uh, Undiscovered Country number one for Image. Uh, and then a lot of the people in the indie scene, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the artists you'll notice we kind of do covers for each other. Uh, Jamie Tyndall just uh, dropped a cover for me today for his Kickstarter campaign for White Widow. He's doing a cover for me for Loco Hero. Marat Michaels, I do covers for him. I'm working on one right now. Uh, I did a Hardly Thin uh, for uh, Comics Elite that went over fantastic, sold out in like 11 minutes. Uh, so I'm kind of known as an artist who does a lot of the female figures, and that's what I get hired for. I draw and paint anything. Um, and then uh, back in 2014 is when I started the idea for Loco Hero. And that's exactly what I wanted to go ahead and talk about now is the actual Kickstarter because two reasons. Uh, I actually, I, I've, I'm very observant on what happens with things and, and how people react with the different things. I know with, noticed with Loco Hero, you were a little, um, you were a little apprehensive about bringing that out. Uh, and, and it's odd because here you just gave off this Im most impressive resume. And you're going ahead and putting out Loco Hero, and you're actually a little skittish about that. Can you go ahead and tell us about that? Yeah, some of it had to do with timing. Uh, originally, I wanted to bring it out in, you know, towards the end of last year, maybe even as far into January. And um, a lot of the artists, friends of mine, like a lot of artists, just didn't get me the art when I needed to. And I'm glad I waited. And all the art was worth it. Uh, but some of it was only coming in as early as last week, as late as last week, but I went ahead and, and launched the Kickstarter. And um, there's a, uh, two weeks ago there, I guess two and a half weeks ago, I was invited to be on a show. It was right when the quarantine was really hitting hard. And, um, and it was called CyberCon and it was all, you know, remote uh, online stuff. And I was just on a panel invited to be on a panel. And there was uh, Charlie Stinkney from uh, who writes white ash and, uh, Phil from uh, Phil's uh, Raw Review, no, Ray's. Anyway, sorry. Um, anyway, we got talking about Kickstarters, and I said, well, you know, I've, I, I literally have all 48 pages done. Like the last five pages are being lettered right now. And I said, but I'm going to put all that on hold because of what's going on. And they said, no, no, don't do it. People are home. They're in front of their computer. Diamond's not shipping. The comics community wants to support, and they said right now, according to stats, that there's 30% less Kickstarters in the comics category, and there's the same amount of money being spelt, spent with the creators. 
And so I was literally still live and I was texting Josh who works for me here in the studio as the studio manager. And I said, we, we got to ramp this up. And we had already started the, the actual writing the story and rewards and things like that. A lot of that was actually even already in there, but I kind of felt like since 2014, then running downfield with the ball myself, paying the artists, you know, getting the project going. And then I just set the ball down on the one yard line, you know, like now's not the right time to try to score. And they were like, no, no, you know, pick it up and we'll help you put it in and we'll help get the word out there. And so uh, much like uh, yourself and uh, being invited onto shows, I did uh, Billy Tucci's earlier this week and you just had a, a, a great backing of the community to help get the word out. And one of the things that blows me away the most isn't necessarily the, uh, the monetary part, but the amount of backers. So I have done three previous Kickstarters for, uh, two were for, um, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, absolutely. Oh, sorry. Um, the, uh, two were for art books and then one was an art portfolio and the most amount of backers I ever had for any of those projects was usually like 100, 150. So to be at 425 right now and climbing and have hit 400, to me, I look at all those new fans who have never backed a Kickstarter. And for me, it'll say new backer, new backer. And then even more complimentary to that, what, there's a few people who have said, I've never backed a Kickstarter in my life. You're my first one. How do I do this? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's just very rewarding and humbling that people are like, oh, I've kind of avoided that. You get it when the person who says, oh, this guy's backed 80 Kickstarters, 150 Kickstarters. I think I've backed 60. <laughs> you know, like we're familiar with, oh, yeah, I want to back that. You know, this looks mm -hmm. cool. Let's help this guy out, this gal, whatever they're doing. Um, so when, when you can see people get behind you like that and respond to, not only the variant cover artists that I brought on, but also the philanthropy aspect of one of the covers, which is called Honor Bound. Uh, you know, I'm donating all the proceeds from that one to military veterans through Operation Second Chance. And uh, I love the fact that that's the number one picked up reward so far. So that's awesome. You know, we might be able to say, here's a check for, you know, $3,000 that goes to, to help our veterans. Exactly. And that's what I wanted to bring up was my second focus on the Kickstarter itself is the fact that the storyline that's in there is not just, I mean, basically, you know, it's got Monty Moore. Everybody's going to be jumping on it, right? So you're going to have a lot of people going, hey, Monty did something. I've got to jump on this. But you've got even a bigger following and a bigger audience on this because of the content. Uh, mm -hmm. The content that's in here actually hit a lot of people a, a lot more than they thought it would. And you've really been talking about what it is. Can you go ahead and give us a uh, synopsis of what the story is about? Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I really love about coming on the shows is it's one thing to say, hey, it's beautifully drawn. Here's the pictures. And here's this, you know, beautiful, uh, you know, action hero. But um, she's really different than a lot of the other, I think, heroes out there. Uh, there's a scene, you know, the opening of the comic. She's sleeping in a cardboard box. She's homeless. Uh, she, there's a scene where she eats out of a garbage can because the homeless shelter where she volunteers runs out of food. She gives everybody else the food first, gives hers away and, you know, says, Hey, I'll, you know, I'll fend for myself. And she's a, a military, she's an army veteran. She was in Afghanistan. Uh, her squad was wiped out in like a rocket attack. And so she comes home with survivor's guilt, PTSD, uh, you know, ends up living on the streets like a lot of veterans do. And that's something personal for me. We have a lot of military in my family. And so uh, the, the way that I came up with the story, I was at the San Diego Comic-Con. I was walking down in front of the convention center at night. Group of cosplayers passes me one direction. Exact same time. Another woman pushing her cart full of her belongings. She obviously lives on the street and clearly struggling from mental illness because she was yelling with herself. She was having an argument with herself and losing. And so it was kind of freaky. And I was, and I just, it literally struck me. What if I had a character who lives on the street and is homeless dresses like these guys over here and think she's a superhero, but has no powers. Right? So you look at something like kick-ass and you say, okay, well, kick-ass doesn't have any powers. He had like 
you know, bad nerve ending. So he could take a pounding. But what if you made your character also not have powers, but like beautiful and also could kick ass. So in her background story that we'll learn later, she grew up as a martial artist. Her dad wanted to be able to defend herself. They were kind of a rough part of town. And um, then she went into the military uh, as maybe part of her only recourse, like college wasn't in the cards or the money. A lot of people, the military is a great way to go. And she was raised very patriotic. So she's service minded. She wanted to serve her country and her community. Um, but, you know, when she comes back, maybe she feels a little bit more like she's broken uh, a little bit. And what happens is, is in the story, she takes a blow to the head. And when she wakes up, essentially, she has this head trauma, which causes a dissociative disorder. And she thinks she's a superhero. And so as it, as things kind of progress, she says, well, this is how a superhero dresses, right? Like, like Batman, or she starts putting on armor and stuff like that. And she's like, no, no, Wonder Woman's tougher. Wonder Woman doesn't need all that armor. So you need to be able to be flexible. And so she cobbles together an outfit from the donations bin at the shelter, right? She doesn't have all these things like Bruce Wayne and Batmobiles and a butler and all this. She has, she's the opposite. She's going out and fighting crime and doing the same thing, but for very different reasons in her head, because she thinks that the ruthless developer tycoon in this first story arc is building a super villain headquarters and not a shopping mall. But it happens to be right where the slums are, where they live. And so he's hired these, you know, thugs and street teams to scrape everybody out so that he can do his thing. So he's, you know, he's a bad guy. Uh, and you learn more about him as the as the the arc will go on and what he's doing and what kind of uh, opposition he represents. But um, one of the things that's also unique is is when she goes into fight or flight mode, it causes what uh, you might heard heard the term before a fugue state. And a fugue state, you know, is when you have like hallucinations and things like that. So if anybody's seen. The Fisher King, or maybe Don Quixote, this kind of thing. So, if she sees a bad guy beating up on her friend, her brain goes, Bad guy. The bad guys might to her look like a ninja, right? So, here's a, here's a scene from the actual comic. And you can see that there's some ninjas in the background. And she's standing there and she looks like this badass Ronin uh, or samurai. Because in her brain, that's how she thinks she must be. If they're bad and she's good, she represents the side of good. So she's going to feel like, oh, man, I'm going to go. It. So we're transported both visually and in the story to a, maybe a different time and place, totally fictitious. And it's in her head. But it still lets us, when we're, when we're receiving or telling the story, to take the, the viewer out of it. And it doesn't look like just a back alley bar brawl fight. Exactly. And I, I, I really like the fact that you took it where she just didn't have all of these items just uh, that she went and bought or anything like that. She actually had to piece together her costume. And I, I think you said it uh, one time or I read in there that she was actually beating somebody with a brick. And that was her method of choice at the time. But in her head, she's actually got, you know, some kind of massive weapon, uh, fantasy looking weapon or something like that to go ahead and take out these bad guys that are in there. Yeah, one of the um, this is a this is a great cover. The, the I, I had such great covers done by people. This is the Marat Michaels cover, and this is a perfect example of. On the one side, we see her in an alley with a gun, with her outfit on, facing off with a thug against a knife. But if we move it over here, and we only see this other side. This is how she sees herself, and this mm -hmm. guy looks like an undead zombie guy with a hawk mask and a spear. Well, that must mean that she's in a like a gladiator outfit and she must be in ancient Rome. And so uh, it's just a, a great depiction of that. Um, here's one of the ones kind of like you were talking about where this is the art core team. So this is the actual team that's doing the interiors, pencils and colors. And so she's in her outfit. She's got a brick for, that's laying around. But the four guys she's fighting look like total you know, medieval evil demon knights. Mm -hmm. that you know she's having to beat down on and um uh, I, d I just think it makes for great storytelling and as a over imaginative kid this is kind of right up my alley oh absolutely 
And from what I've seen thus far, I mean, the artwork looks very fluid in there. I cannot wait. And if you don't mind, I was going to ask you whenever I do get it, because I did back it, if mm-hmm. you don't mind me doing a review, and then I can bring you back on as a guest as well, because I would love to do that and give you my review. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Now, and moving on, uh, of course, first off and foremost, everybody that's watching this, get on the Kickstarter, look at Loco Hero, support it. I always say support comes in all different directions on there. If you don't have the money to actually financially back it right now, share that thing out, get other people involved, but it goes towards a great cause. Uh, And the whole book in itself is just a great cause as well. I I backed it. (laughs) Yeah, I think the story itself, I, you know, even when I was doing my Kickstarter video, I, I said I could I could feel confident in saying it's got great art. I think it's got a great story and there's a great cause behind it as well. And you know, part of the when she's cobbling together her outfit, I'm reminded of the fact that all the things that she's putting on were discarded by other people. And a lot of times the people on the street who live there are discarded by society. You know, whether it's not all by choice and some of it's just uh, a lot of it is by circumstance and, and we do have a lot of mental illness. And so you, you can't hold that against somebody. And I like the fact that Operation Second Chance, who some of the proceeds from the Honor Bound cover, which is uh, this pledge here that people can back, which is kind of my for PS, uh, PTSD awareness, uh, goes to those veterans who are coming out of Walter Reed Hospital in uh, Washington, D.C., who need help, connection with their family. They'll fly people in. Uh, they're having procedures or help them get on their feet so that there's a greater chance that they don't end up on the street. Uh, and if they're struggling with mental, emotional, or physical issues, that you know we, we, we don't discard these people who have been in service of our country. And a lot of them have sacrificed so much And they don't, they don't come, you don't just get to pick back up your life the way it was and go, oh yeah, you did your four years, you know, you're like, hey, it's not like going to college. You know what I mean? Um, um, Most of those people who do that, a lot of times their life has just changed, you know, some for the better, some for the worse. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the Kickstarter as a whole, yeah, it looks great. It's not only the look of it, like you said, it's actually the content as well. I cannot wait to get my copy and hopefully everyone else is just as excited about it. You definitely need to look into it. Uh, you actually have uh, a local hero pay or group on Facebook as well. Um, yeah, so I started look for that, that too. Yeah, I started that way back when uh, and I decided to uh, self fund this comic for four, uh, six years since 2014 out of my pocket. Uh, and I paid the artists along the whole way. So everybody got paid. I didn't try to use my position in the industry, which I hate to say it, I could have done. And then like, hey, this is great exposure for you. You know, come do this project for me. You know what? I did all those projects for other people when I was a younger artist. And, you know, most of the time exposure doesn't work. And even if it does work, it doesn't put food on the table. I mean, in the time that, that my colorist has been working on this for a couple of years, got married, had a kid, you know, like you, you can't be doing it. Hey, by the way, I need to go work on that comic book that I'm working on for high profile artists that I'm doing for free. I'm like, hey, man, you get me pages, you get paid. And, you know, I even advanced people along the way if they're like, well, I'm kind of in a bind and I don't know if I can work on it this week. I'm like, here's money for five pages. Mm-hmm. Take care. Do what you need to do. Because the thing is, is I can, I'm keeping the artwork in the industry because I might get paid for a cover. And then I turn around and use that same money to hire people to do my book. And, and uh, everybody wins. So it's a win-win. Absolutely. And that kind of segues into my next question here. I swear, if you can see the questions, I'm not aware that you can see all this. <laughs> I, I can. I, you know, Jim Noble has, says he's a, a veteran who has PTSD. And he loves the fact I'm doing this. And, and Jim, I did not know that. You know, I know you follow my art uh, and that sort of thing. And uh, and I appreciate the support and that you, you know, letting us know that and that you do appreciate it and that you did serve your country and, you know, that it, it's left its indelible mark in and not a good way. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I feel I feel very fortunate that, you know, I I didn't, I don't have to cope with that. So I feel gratuitous for those who have sacrificed and three of my cousins uh were in the military this is a picture of my grandfather uh is a portrait that i did he was in the navy he uh, retired as an admiral Uh, his flying license was signed by wilbur 
Wilbur, or one of the Wright brothers. Uh, so he was uh, uh, also served his country. So we have military service in my family back to George Washington's armies. And I have a certificate on the wall here in the house. Mine's a copy, not the original, that's signed by George Washington. And my oldest cousin who was in the Navy has the original that's signed by George Washington that says this lieutenant served under me in Washington's armies. And that's amazing to me. Wow, that that is. I mean, that's <laughs> that's kind of hard to go back behind and say anything after that. It is amazing. I mean, it seems like the core values, honor, integrity, loyalty, respect, that, that actually flows very highly in your family. Yeah. And I don't, uh, I don't necessarily know why, like, I think I'm more about the patriotic part and, and supporting veterans than maybe some others in my family, but it, you know, we're all different. And for me, you know, I sort of look at it like I, I decided, you know, not to go in the military and I had strong desire to do art. So I went right to art school. I paid for myself to go through school. You know, my parents didn't pay for it. Um, they said, we think you should try to do this on your own and we'll help you if you need to. Um, but in a way I can now serve and help those who have served with my art. So that's, you know, that's sort of my calling and that's my way to, to try to help them. I like that. Now that brings up another question that I have for you actually is you've got multiple sketchbooks. How many do you have now exactly? There's been eight total published. Okay. So yeah. most so sketchbooks. The, yeah. The early ones are now out of print. Like I don't have any of those. Right. But I, have three, I have the three or four more recent that people can buy through my website. And then on the Kickstarter, there's uh, a grouping called the Monster uh, uh, Book Club. And you can get, I think it's, I think it's five, one, two, three, maybe it's four. Um, anyway, you can kind of get all cut up in any of the books that I have in stock. And it's all comics, games, and pinups. Absolutely. You have that. You have all of your art because you have a ton of art that's available and to look at and everything. And then you've also, you've done motorcycles and <laughs> you've done uh, uh, custom motorcycle uh, painting, stuff like that. So my question is, how do you make time to do all of this? Where, where does all the time come from? <laughs> well, I can tell you a couple things. <laughs> I probably <laughs> outwork most artists. I love what I do, but I regularly put in 12 to 15 hour days. Like I'm sure I'll be working tonight till two probably. Um, so if, especially during the quarantine and the Kickstarter, if I'm not, if I don't have something else to do, I'm working and I, you know, sleep six, maybe seven hours a night, but I don't have kids where Laura and I don't have kids. And so we're, we we're, we're both kind of dedicated to our work and I love what I do. Um, so I'm a pretty high volume artists. I think that's where a lot of the art and sketchbooks come from. When it comes to commercial art, I usually very rarely ever say no, even, you know, at the sacrifice sometimes of personal time. And you say, oh, well, I was going to go do this this weekend, but this great opportunity came up for me to do this, but they need it in three days. And there's been countless projects. Uh, and maybe that's why my career is where it is. It's at a great place. I have a, a pretty substantial client list, you know, from Lucasfilm to Harley Davidson and Coors and Playboy and, he, and just a lot of clients outside of comics, you know, the, the National Finals Rodeo, or Barrett Jackson, and I have an entire separate website just for Western and fine art. And that's been a direction that I've been going in um, the last uh, two years, three years. Uh, if I turn this a little bit, you can see a couple of the good, the bad, and the ugly there on the wall. Those are uh, canvas wrapped prints. And so on my website for that, it gives me a chance to stretch and bring in a love of Western because I grew up on a cattle ranch and, and pop culture. So, you know, there's art on there from Tombstone and Pale Rider and I do commissions for people, but I also like to stretch and do, you know, big fine art pieces that are totally separate from superheroes. And I think that makes me a better artist. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of looking into your websites that you sent to me and the Western one that's on there. I mean, you've got Tombstone, you've got Lonesome Dove, you've got Good, Bad, the Ugly. About the only thing you're missing on there is Blazing Saddles. <laughs> <laughs> and I can quote that one pretty good. I, I would like to do a Blazing Saddles one because that's just such a great film. <laughs> <laughs> now, my next question would be, you've got all of this that you have to make time for and all. What music do you listen to or how do you get your inspiration to go ahead and focus so much on doing your work? 
Uh, well, I'm a big movie guy. So a lot of times when I'm working in the studio, uh, I like to have a movie on because as a storyteller, um, a lot of people don't know, you know, the writing and stuff that I've done. So I've written 12 screenplays. I think I've sold nine script options. Uh, the local hero story is written. The first graphic novel is actually written as a pilot episode. So it's a 60 page pilot episode that I then turned into a comic book. Um, but, uh, so I liked, I like the writing and the storytelling. So the reason why I'm more apt to listen to a movie or uh, a TV series like criminal minds or law and order, uh, CSI, I like procedural crime dramas and things like that is because you get ideas sometimes about characters and storytelling. Uh, so when it comes to music, I range all the way from, uh, Garth Brooks to Rammstein. Uh, I was supposed to see Volbeat uh, this last month. Super disappointed. Uh, we also had tickets to both see Brian Adams, Bon Jovi, Journey, uh, somebody else. We were going to see like Joan Jett at, at Coors Field. And of course, these were canceled. So I'm a big 80s guy. And I like all the way from rock to, like I said, Garth Brooks. I was raised on a cattle ranch. So I, I do like country as well. Um, more more the traditional country. I'm not as fond of a some of today's pop country. Uh, but strangely enough, I like kid rock too. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, moving from the music, uh, we're going to go, because the last thing that you mentioned was country going into kid rock. Now we're going to talk about, let's talk about Coffin Comics because where I have seen you more, and there's Bob right there, Coffin Claws. Welcome to the show. <laughs> That's right. Uh, oh, by the way, let me go ahead and do this real quick before I forget, since, you know, in case anyone's watching, you're not going to catch me. Got my coin. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. I'm the new well, guy I, to all this, so you know, I got to have I mine ready. Know, I can give Bob Cronister a shout out. Check this bad boy out. That oh, yeah. is a, that's a custom Monty Moore st built by Bob for me. This is my steampunk pen. I keep it right here in the studio. And then he made this uh, super cool uh, sheet to go with it. And I uh, try to take it to shows, make sure somebody doesn't kipe it. Check that out. It's even like a bullet down here on the end. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, the, oh, and this, this is my Western one. It's right here, too. This is my cowboy, mm -hmm. cowboy one that Bob made for me. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, he, he does some, he made the pouch for this one here and got that for me. I mean, if you see the, the detail in there with all the skulls and everything, I, I am more than honored that he did that for me. So, thank you, Bob. Isn't that cool? Yep. It's great to be part of the Sworn Nation. I mean, it definitely is. Absolutely. Yesterday, so, I was wearing my Coffin comic shirt in one of the other interviews. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to go ahead and bring up when we're talking about uh, Coffin, of course, is number one, whenever I first got really involved in knowing about you and everything was whenever I kept seeing you in Coffin, but not only on the covers and all, but you're at the events, you're doing things, you're always uh, a kind of a uh, more or less a figurehead with them. But whenever they did the Coffin Con online, mm -hmm. that's whenever you got my respect. And I'm just letting you know oh. that right now. Because okay. everyone jumped up there and they did what they could to go ahead and make everything better for everybody. And you took it out of your time to make sure you were there the entire time. You made it fun. You made it informative. You made it fun. I think I already said that, but you definitely made it twice as fun. <laughs> oh, great. Now, are you talking was, about the one we had there in April? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right at the end of I was down there for the fine art show because it yes. just came to Emerald City. And so it was for, fortuitous for me that I happened to be finishing up uh, this sort of artist residence of three months in Scottsdale. And he said, hey, do you want to come down? Marat's going to come over, Mike DeBalfo. And I'm like, I wouldn't miss it. So I had to actually leave my booth for the whole weekend. Uh, well, maybe it was one day. I guess that was one day um, for that event, which was just fantastic. And it's kind of a new paradigm. It shows that you can stay connected with fans and somebody like Alice Danzig or Roger Navarro over Haley over in Australia can watch over there. And then somebody on the East coast, West coast, and nobody is like, Oh man, I missed out on this. I couldn't go to the show and they're all bummed. And you're like, you know what? Everybody is absolutely equal playing. You're all watching together. And it's great because it's very inclusive. Absolutely. And, and, your presence on there, I mean, I'm not downplaying what Brian Polito did by any means because he set that all up and everything. It was just 
you were there and that positive energy that was coming from that and coming from yourself and coming from everyone else that was involved in there, like I said, you had my ultimate respect on that because oh, thank you. everyone could have looked at it. There was two ways to look at it. You know, you could have gone and looked and going, I can't go outdoors. Now what am I going to do? My life is over. No, actually y'all were having a party and we were invited. That was right. the best part. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was really kind of a, a, a stroke of genius. And I think, um, you know, uh, Brian being kind of the you know, outlaw publisher and doing his own thing, you know, everybody else, we kind of pay attention, you know, or if Brian invites me to do something, I mean, I've never said no to either a cover idea or anything he's wanted or to be a part of something. You know, I, I go out of my way because um, in comics, I can remember in 2014 and 15 when I first started doing covers and the fans started reaching out to me directly and be like, Hey, are you going to have books to sell? Do you have art? And most of the time I always had to wait to turn around and sell art till I went to a convention. And I can remember going to Laura and saying, this is different. This is, I've never felt like part of the club. And this is like the cool kids. Hey, Brian, thanks for joining. Um, and, uh, and I just, uh, the only word I can think of is inclusive. And then um, it's also nice because this other art show that I did, I, I was able to go to Fiend Fest last year uh, and really connect. And, and that was more like party con. Um, but it was also a chance for everybody to connect, hang out, do stuff social and still get, you know, great collectability people they had a trading area and so even though there's you know there's quite a bit of commerce going on but that show was as personally and financially rewarding to me as going to a largish con you know like a mid-size motor city chicago but without all the overhead and the flights and all that like the without all the stress <laughs> And I was Absolutely. like, oh, I was thinking, this, this is kind of the shit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I will say, for those of you that are watching right now, and any of my friends that are in here, if you're not part of the Sworn, then we need to have a serious talk after this over with. We'll, we'll get you there. But for anyone who will be watching, of course, and everything, I want to ask on behalf of you, what is your definition of being Sworn? Me personally? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to treating the other members of the shared passion with respect and helpfulness. And even though sometimes, you know, people can get a little bit competitive sometimes with their, um, collectibles. I got this. You don't have that. I have this from the old days. And there's some new, you know, new fans that I just love the fact that they've only discovered Lady Death in the last six months. And it is the new thing to them. They're trying to find old stuff. and They're into it. And there are collectors who have things from 25 years ago who might go, you know what? You don't have one of those. I have two. Let, let me, let me hook you up. I mean, the stuff that Bob, Tony Buck, Dane Ellingson, all these guys, they're always sending books and care packages to each other. Hey, look at this. Tony Buck this year, when I was down in Arizona, I wasn't even here at the time. I made a comment on a live feed about seeing a black sketch cover, and I'd never seen one. And he goes, oh, yeah, th this book had one, this book had one, this book had one. So I, I come back from Arizona on a, uh, to go to a friend's wedding, and here's this care package. And not only does it have three or four of these kind of sketch covers, like a black Tomb Raider, I was like, whoa, that's the bomb. But a signed Lady Death, like he knows I'm going to turn that. I was like, hey, is this for you? Do you want me to draw something for you? He goes, no, no, that's for you. You do what you want. I had some extra. And he sent me four or five super cool um, cowboy comics, right? Because he knows I like Western art. An old Wyatt Earp. I mean, this stuff was from like the 40s through the 50, well, probably 50s and 60s. But I mean, these things are cool. You know, I kind of want to frame a couple and put it up in the studio and that sort of thing. So to me, the, the sort of uh, family, I wanted to say brotherhood, but there's plenty of sisters in the sworn too. Uh, and uh, it's the camaraderie and the family. And that's why uh, if I wasn't invited or I couldn't make it to something, you know, I, I'd feel left out too. And so I am fortunate that I've done enough. I don't care what it is. I don't, I don't care if it's a $500, you know, 10.0 graded book and, and, you know, somebody's going to turn around and sell it, or it's a sketch on a piece of paper for 
a new fan who says, this is my first drawing ever, you know, and I get that other people, that's a part of their income. But for me, it's just a personal thing. You know, it's one thing if it's a remark or a sketch, but I'm, I'm always thrilled and happy and honored to sign for a fan. And I'm usually not the guy that somebody shows up with like a stack of 50 books. You'd have to work <laughs> awfully hard, right? Because of the varied books that I'm on. But now that I've done like 40 plus um, Lady Death, you know, now at, at an event like one of Brian, somebody could show up with a legit stack. But again, I just, I'd be honored. Well, I have a Helena one that I need oh, you to sign for me that right I will on. be getting Jim Noble to slab for me. So that's going to happen. Right on. Yeah. So that's my first ever freelance. So um, I think this week for the first time ever, I'm going to actually put Lords number one on my website available because I have two cases in mint condition that have one box has never even been opened. And I thought, you know what? People actually might enjoy these because it's my first ever published work in the comics field. Whereas Helena is my first freelance cover that wasn't a self-published book. So Absolutely. Now we've got, we've gone over quite a bit of material on here. I could keep you all night. I know I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask you <laughs> one last thing here real quick before you go ahead and leave to go, uh, go ahead and go over this is what's in the future for Monty Michael Moore. So I'm pretty excited about the way that the Kickstarter is going. And I, and I pay attention to not only what Brian and Coffin is doing, Marat Michaels, Jamie Tyndall, any of these uh, peers in the industry that, uh, have kind of already taken the self-publishing step. I kind of feel like for a lot of years, I've been at everybody else's party and I haven't thrown my own. So this is really the first time I'm saying, hey, why don't you guys come to my house? This is the kind of party I want to throw. And so um, there's another project that I've just sort of brought back on, on, on track, so to speak, and that's called Blood and Bullets. And oh, that's yeah. a, it's a vampire Western. And it's a, a, a three times option screenplay that I wrote about 10 years ago. And of course it's got, you know, beautiful ladies and chaps. And, you know, my, my tagline is gunfights and vampire bites. Um, and uh, most of the characters are actually female because it was written for a director, a uh, producer director who was a woman he said, I love this idea of the vampire Western. I love that story, but it was kind of all men. The, the one that I wrote that was called dead by sundown. And it didn't have strong female characters. And she said, could you write a new story? And so um, that page also has, you can search Blood and Bullets comic and the page will come up and you can follow that page as well. So I think what I'd like to do is, is kind of do what, what Coffin does and have a, a multiple title thing going. And I didn't think about that I would do that until like four days ago. And I thought, wow, this is going really well. I really could do a Kickstarter per quarter and if people aren't to support it, you know, and alternate the stories and keep them running. And I could have Loco Hero going and I could have Blood and Bullets uh, going in very different stories. Uh, and yet still, I think the kind of stories that my fan base would want and still, you know, speak to me. The other one isn't military. It's all supernatural. And, you know, it's more like uh, Kate Beckinsale and the underworld meets Tombstone. <laughs> Oh, I'm sold. It's a done deal. Yeah. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, you know, the goal will be continue doing what I'm doing, take on a few less uh, commercial client projects, focus a lot of the energies on getting better and learning how to be an efficient publisher, somebody who has, you know, great customer service, offers a quality product. You know, I'm not going to rush stuff. I, I started all these projects that I'm doing years and years ago. So I think they have a, a pretty great foundation. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> the more Kickstarters, the better. That's right. <laughs> uh, that uh, it kind of feels, so I've been in the industry 28 years and it kind of feels like when I hit the 25 year mark, only two or three years ago, that I finally kind of got where I felt like people knew the art and that there was a fair amount of respect there. And I think for a lot of my career, I've just been kind of, the journeyman artist, like working in the trenches, never a superstar. I'm not the guy who has big lines at my table and that people are, you know, waiting out from. I, I They can get sketches. They come and get things. I sell a lot of art because I think it's reasonably priced um, for what I deliver. Uh, but, you know, I kind of feel like I'm finally to the point where it's paying off a little bit and you don't have to work quite as hard. 
Uh, and I think a lot of that, believe it or not, is due to social media. And I like the one-on-one -on -one interaction. You know, Bob and I were friends before we ever got to meet for the first time down in Florida. You know, he took me out shooting. Uh, we went to the range. You got to do social stuff together. So I really like the the interaction of the the social media and converting collectors and people who are fans into friends. That's the best way to put it right there because I'm telling you right now, I cannot wait until Sworn Fest to actually meet all of y'all. <laughs> well, I know the complete lineup hasn't been uh, uh, that, uh, you know, announced and, and uh, lineup. So uh, I hope I'm there. I'm not sure if I will be or not. Uh, that's all in Brian's hands and, and we'll see how it goes. Well, I can say, I can say for sure we will eventually meet. So that oh, will happen. Yeah, so sure. whether it's at Sworn Fest or somewhere else, it'll definitely happen. Yeah. But, Do you uh, ever go to New York? I don't know if New York will happen this year, but. Uh, I have not been as of yet. Uh, okay. We were waiting to see what was going to be going on this year. So that's just kind of up in the air for right now. Right. But hey, if we got to wait till next year, I'm good with that. I'm patient. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I kind of, you know, I'm okay if I get to take a year off from shows. Uh, I've been to over 400 conventions and uh, I certainly have my favorites. But, you know, even in San Diego, San Diego is not the. Uh, friendly, fun, hang out with your bud show. It is mass commercialism. You get steamrolled by crowds. It's hard to get into restaurants. Everything's overpriced. I mean, you'd think it would be like, hey, you know, I used to tell people, hey, look, uh, the nerds are in town. And then once it turned into hundreds of millions of dollars, it was like, yes, the nerds are in town. But, you know, a burger and two drinks will cost you 50 bucks you know, cause you're in downtown San Diego and it's not cheap to get a hotel room or anything. So to me, San Diego is very commercial. And for many years, it's kind of felt like it's the necessary evil. I know a lot right. of people want to experience it, but I have experienced it 27, 28 times. Um, so, you know what, I'm okay taking a year off, you know, and I still get to keep my booth and I don't, I, I you know, I can, I can have a mojito on the back porch I can go to the lake. I can go to the mountains. I can go for a bike ride and not have to have my whole summer just conventions because that's like convention season. Oh, my God. But <laughs> it's it's been such a big part of our income as artists. It was crazy road warriors. And uh, I kind of feel like the support that I've gotten through Kickstarter is commensurate with two or three big national shows. And I can see why, you know, Brian and some of the other folks are like, you know what? I'm not going to be on the road as much. I can reach my fans and deliver a great product and everybody's included, not just the people who live within a four hour drive are going to fly out to do it because sometimes that also limits it. We don't want to limit it to where the fan who has $25 to spend on that exclusive book or that print set of prints or whatever gets left out as opposed to somebody saying, holy cow, if I want to go to Emerald City for the weekend you better save up like two grand, you know, by the time you pay for a hotel room and a flight and all this kind of thing uh, for some of these bigger shows, it's, it's a, it's a bunch. I mean, a, a, an exhibitor badge for San Diego is 500 bucks. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> it's not <Yeah>. cheap. <laughs> no, I mean, you get a lot of exposure and a lot of things are probably moving a little bit on that, but still that's not cheap. Yeah, but the, the problem is most of the industry people, because it's such a nightmare to walk around, nobody leaves their booth. I'm fortunate that I actually have a bathroom right outside the door, and I am literally in front of the G door. So I can go to the bathroom and come back to my booth and not fight mass crowds. But, you know, DC and Marvel art directors, you know, they don't walk around anymore. They don't have time to go through Artist Alley. They do scheduled stuff, and they disappear back into the shadows. They're not out there like the good old days, you know, combing for the next talent because all the talent is coming and, and showering them with portfolios. So when people would always tell me, you know, hey, I want to go to San Diego to experience it. It's a lot of the Hollywood that's there. If you want to see a movie star and be in Hall H and catch The Walking Dead, that's an experiential thing. But if you want to buy a T-shirt and see what it's like or get some cool autographs, any good mid size, upper size, Motor City, uh, Chicago, Florida, they all have great cons. And it's the exact same stuff. Most of the vendors, different artists line up and just has less Hollywood, which I'm okay with because <laughs> the invasion of Hollywood 
you know, brings its own kind of like, I don't know, flaming bag of nickels. You know, you're like, ah, do I want that? Do I not want that? Ugh. <laughs> I completely agree. Yeah. Monty, I, I, like I said, I could keep you here all night. I know you've got some other things you need to get on. I know you've got some I, other I, artwork. I got two, I've got two covers that I'm working on right on the other side of the table here. So I have, I, I've never done this before where I have two that I'm painting. So I have Mike DeBalfo <laughs> right next to, to Evast, you know, and I'm literally, you know, markers and airbrush and paint. I'm going back and forth between the two. And, uh, you know, I, I love it, but it's also a bit stressful. Because I'm not, I don't color a lot of people's work much anymore. So to do fully painted versions of theirs and have it be my own character, I'm like, well, this isn't good enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I mean, I have greatly been, I've enjoyed myself. It has been an absolute honor having you on here. Thank if you'll you. give us a last audible shout out on where we can find you, because everything will be pinned on here so you can get to it. But if you'll just let us know one last time. Great. Yeah. So there's a, obviously a lot of social media. So you can look up Loco Hero on Kickstarter. That's going now. You could send me a friend request at Monty Michael Moore on Facebook. You can follow my YouTube channel, which is called Monty Moore's Art Attack. Uh, Phil's got my website up here now, which is called MavArts. And that's short for Maverick Arts. You can also write out Maverick Arts. Uh, and that'll take you to the pop culture website. You can also find me as MavArts on both Instagram not a big Instagram guy, but I do post some. And then on Twitter, I'm MavArts Monty. Uh, and then we also have a MavArt studio for Joshua who helps me here. And so we do some marketing there. And um, there's an artist page for me on Facebook. If you want to just see the art and you're not somebody who wants to socially interact, just follow the artist page at Monty M. Moore because I really do try to keep my personal page for people who would like to interact. Doesn't mean you have to buy my art, but I need to see people's names pop up on occasion. Otherwise, you're just taking up space. And because a lot of people do want to follow the artwork, I try to keep the uh, the sort of 5,000 friends, people I know personally, and people who would like to interact. Uh, uh, otherwise, I do invite them to follow my artist page. You can follow Loco Hero. You can follow Blood and Bullets. Uh, Mind's Eye Games is the name of the game company. But on my main page, you'll be able to look over on the left you can see a number of those pages linked right there. So um, I, I, I'm almost always on online. I, I answer my own questions. Uh, Josh is helping a lot with the customer service on Kickstarter, which the link's up there. Um, so that's great. And um, uh, as Phil said earlier, any any support, if it's not a project that, you per that resonates personally with you, uh, if you know veterans or other collectors who you think might enjoy it, please just share it to them. We don't, we don't ask people uh, to spend money on things they don't want. I don't, I'm not guilting anybody into it. Uh, if you'd like to back it, there's people who are buying multiple books and just making a donation and saying, hey, I want a couple of those honor bound books or they're gonna give them away. Um, and so the honor bound pledge is the one where we're donating all the proceeds and that's kind of the PST, PTSD awareness cover. Uh, and uh, we might be doing something in the either um, post Kickstarter on Indiegogo, and we might have a different um, outreach for some of the books, might do some uh, for Denver's homeless or maybe a different military organization. So uh, we're going to try to spread it around a little bit so that we can reach the most amount of people in need as possible. Uh, and I feel very fortunate that I'm in a position to, to be able to share my stories and share the support and the good fortune. Absolutely. I mean, you've, you've done quite a bit. You're still working on quite a bit. Uh, definitely everybody y'all need to follow Monty and see what he's doing and go to the Kickstarter support in any way you can. The Kickstarter is back up here in front so you can see it. It is linked in here as well. So you can go directly to it. Easy ways to get to it. Yep. Monty, thank you. Thank, you, thank you, Russell, for saying, don't go. We want more. See, he knows the <laughs> tagline. He knows the tagline. Well, expect more, my friend. You'll see me online soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Phil. All right. So we had Monty Michael Moore on here tonight. It was an amazing show. Uh, greatly enjoyed it on a personal level, on an uh, informative level. I hope you all learned a lot more about, <laughs> about the man and what he does. I can't keep the taglines. They just keep falling out. But uh, he's, he's into everything. But the main point is I always have a closing statement, and tonight is no different. 
I've always said many times before that you always want to give more. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use the tagline blatantly on that one because he does so much for this business aside from just doing the business. And what I mean by that, he does a lot of charitable things. And Loco Hero is definitely one of those that, yes, he is getting paid for this. He's not even remotely telling you differently on that. But a lot of the proceeds are going towards helping people. So I said it many, many times on my closing statements. Do what you can to go ahead and help and ask yourself, look in the mirror if you have to and say, what have I done to help somebody today? Maybe it's time to go ahead and just go to his Kickstarter, hit that share button, or maybe even pledge to it or tap someone on the shoulder uh, from a safe distance, of course, and let them know, hey, we've got something over here you need to take a look at. Just some thoughts to go ahead and go with there, but give more, get more. We'll leave it with that. This is Demon Field Comics in More, New Jersey. Keep it indie, y'all.